All right, and welcome to the first episode of Further Inquiry. Today I'm joined by Dr. Adam DeVille. He is a Ukrainian Greek Catholic deacon, a psychology professor at the University of St. Francis in Indiana, and a psychologist in private practice. Today we're going to be discussing the clerical abuse crisis in the Catholic Church. So Dr. DeVille, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Awesome. So let's jump right into it. Um, for our audience, can you explain your background? Like specifically, how did you become a deacon and how did you get um, become a psychologist? Well, I'll need to be more precise on both terms. I'm not a deacon. I'm a subdeacon. Um, and I'm not, I'm a psychotherapist, but uh, a psychologist is a legislatively protected title, at least in Indiana. Um, and so there's a somewhat there's a slight difference there. I'm not I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm a I'm a psychotherapist. My license is actually clinical mental health counseling um, in private practice. So um, how did I become both? Excuse me. Um, let me just deal with the clinical part. Um, clinical training was always my original goal when I was an undergraduate in the 1990s. Um, and then I got pulled into teaching high school and then decided to do a doctorate and realized that I love the academic life. And so I've been on a long detour until writing my book on the sex abuse crisis in 2018-19, um, at which point I decided to resume clinical training because I was being uh, what felt like inundated with stories from victims and victims' families in the church uh, who had been just... Uh, abominably treated. They hadn't really been treated at all. Most of them had been sort of shoved to the sidelines and not offered anything uh, by way of significant help. Um, and so I was getting letters and texts and emails and Facebook posts and, and so on from complete strangers um, up and down the country um, asking what could be done. And so at that point I decided to <laughs> excuse me, um, resume clinical training and enter into private practice because I realized I could do a lot more for people in clinical work than I could by writing more books. Awesome. Well, that's, that's a shame to hear about, about them being mistreated. So that's so that's where we're, we're going to get into, um, specifically the, the issue of survivors. Um, so what made what made you specifically decide you, you wanted to help clergy abuse survivors? You mentioned a bit a bit, but could you go into further detail? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, my practice has not just been limited to that by any means, but um, it, it's it's been a significant part of it. And and uh, one of the reasons was the fact that um, they're not getting much clinical attention in general. Um, there was a study came out in July of twenty twenty one, I think it was, um, an estimate from the Centers for Disease Control that approximately 20% of American adult males have probably been sexually abused as children. We don't actually have any hard data beyond that, and that was an estimate. Um, and so there's very little being done, um, and this was a population that I felt uh, drawn towards. Now, I work with a wide variety of, of patients. I don't just do um, sex abuse survivors. I don't think any practice could just be confined to that because it's such intense, heavy, long-term work. Um, but it's a, it's a population that needs to be served, and there aren't many of us serving it. And so I felt, well, I can fill a need. Why don't I try? Wow, 20 percent. That's that's a shocking number. But I mean, I'm glad to know that there are people who, such as yourself, who are willing to help to help them. So can you describe the extent of the damage that has been done to clergy abuse survivors? Like, how does it like affect them, like their everyday lives? Yeah, um, one of the things you realize in clinical work is that no two presentations are the same. Uh, and by that, I mean that even if you've got two people who come in with, you know, bipolar disorder, for example, or, or uh, anxiety or something, um, even if they have the same diagnosis, the presentations are going to be quite different because they're bound up by the structures of the personality and the background of the individual person. Um, and so uh, adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse present quite differently. Um, that said, there are some common features, um, and there are heightened risks for substance abuse, for example, for depression, for anxiety, for um, 
other forms of self-harm. Um, and they're often um, uh, in relationships that are very, very difficult to sustain uh, because you've been, you've had your trust at a most vulnerable stage violated by one or more human beings. Uh, and that tends to leave a permanent mark on your ability to trust anybody else thereafter, including the therapist in the transference. Um, so oftentimes when I see them, um, it's because a marriage is falling apart or a marriage has fallen apart um, or they're alienated from uh, partners, spouses, children, uh, and so on. Um, there's often a tremendous amount of uh, anger that just kind of flares up for reasons they can't figure out. Um, so there are some common features, but there are also, um, as I say, uh, a lot of differences. For some people, child sex abuse is utterly devastating. Uh, Leonard Shengold was a prominent American psychiatrist in New York who just died a couple years ago, wrote one of the first books on it in 1991, and he called it soul murder, which I think is an apt phrase, uh, particularly for Christians to think about. So it can be absolutely devastating, and you, you can have a very tough time building a life afterwards. But I've also seen some people who have um, managed to be, you know, relatively successful and hold a lot of things together. So you you never know exactly how it's going to show up and what kind of damage it's going to do in advance. Um, then uh, what does like a treatment of a survivor usually consist of? Like what do you go through with them like on, in, during a therapy session? Um, there's no, again, there's, there's more diversity here than I can generalize from. Um, no session is the same, even with the same person. Um, uh, what do you do? It's hard to, um, in general, let me, let me put it this way. Um, Judith Herman is a, a, a Harvard psychiatrist who wrote one of their early books in 1995, I think it was, on trauma and sexual violence. Um, and she said, and, and I think she's right, that treatment broadly has to consist of sort of three stages. Um, there's the first stage in which the patient has to simply come to feel um, contained and that they are in a safe environment where they'll not be re-traumatized. And that might sound quite simple, but if you've had really devastating abuse at a, at a vulnerable developmental stage like childhood, um, even basic trust is often shot. You need to build that with the clinician. Um, the second stage or goal is to be able to tell the story. Um, what happened? Uh, what was that like? What was the experience? Um, and then through that therapeutic relationship, that working alliance in which the, to the story is told, you rework it uh, so that it's still there, but it no longer has the power over you that it did. And you're able to experience some measure of emotional freedom from it. And at that point, you enter into kind of the third, the final uh, phase of treatment in which you, you begin to rebuild, <coughs> excuse me, you begin to rebuild your life and move on with your life. And, you know, uh, for some, therapy comes to an end. Now, that sounds very simple, but it's not. Um, and it's not the kind of thing that you can just kind of race people through in six sessions. Uh, if, if we're looking at serious long-term sexual violence, then oftentimes the treatment uh, can take years. And even then, um, to be realistic about it, I think we have to recognize that we can help you build a life. We can help um, cover over, you know, let healthy scar tissue grow over these wounds, but we're never going to make them go away. Like, what would you say is probably like the longest like um, case you you've ever seen like in terms of treatment? I suppose without violating um, any um, privacy. Yeah, in general, if I'm taking somebody into treatment for, and I know they're primarily motivated to deal with child and sexual abuse, um, I don't put a timeline on it, but I expect that we're probably going to be seeing each other for two to five years, um, depending on the frequency. I I work if I can. I like to get people in at least twice a week, but most people can't do that nowadays. So once a week for 50 minutes is not a lot of time. People say, well, two hour, two years in treatment, that's a long time. Not really. I mean, think of how many years you've had, how many decades you've had before you begin to acknowledge this. For me to see you, uh, you know, um, once a week for a couple of years is, is not nearly as much as it sounds. Mm -hmm. The other method 
that is quite powerful, um, and I've done this, I just finished one up a, uh, not quite a year ago now, um, is a group. Group therapy is often overlooked, but uh, I ran a group therapy for male survivors, adult male survivors. Um, and you can often have uh, faster breakthroughs in group than you can in individual treatment, although they usually go hand in hand. So group therapy is is uh, another tool that's really important. Um, so the next question, do most survivors tend to leave the church and what would be their specific reasons be? Um, I can't really answer that in that um, I have not done any studies on that and I don't know if we have studies. Um, Stephen Bullivant is a sociologist in London um, who's written a recent book on people leaving the Catholic Church. Um, there's a whole variety of reasons, some of them not as obvious as we might think, but in terms of the survivors, I don't know if we actually have data. Anecdotally, excuse me, anecdotally I've heard from both survivors and families that some of them actually want to stick around. Um, some of them feel like this is my church and I'm not leaving, uh, but it's very hard to stay a part of an institution that has both abused you and then ignores you afterwards. But as I say, I don't know of, of data to be able to answer that question with any real um, precision. Um, then I guess then like for maybe for an ind for at least like for some individuals who have personally left, like would you say maybe in your in your own like professional opinion is leave for, for, for those that have left is leaving um, necessary for their own personal healing? Um, yeah, I suppose some people might say that. Um, it's it it's really hard again to to generalize from you know a small sample, um, and that's that's an individual decision. You know, part of good psychotherapy is not uh, advice giving. So, if people ask me whether they should stay or whether they should go, my response is always, "Well, what do you want to do?" Uh, because it's your life, and you know, I'm not here to tell you. It's I'm not a guru to to tell you what to do. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen a mixed picture. I mean, I've seen some people who really keep their distance afterwards, um, but I also know some people who want to kind of maintain a connection to the church. Um, for survivors um, who have reported abuse, like in your own, like um, in your own um, experience, like mm -hmm. how often have survivors like maybe experienced a uh, mistreatment by cl by Catholics after reporting it? Well, again, I don't know if we have any widespread data to to answer that um you know I, I i hear things from uh patients from uh, other people i know um from um friends who've had family members abused for example um it's really mixed their responses uh <clears throat> and some people but on the whole i guess i i could say this uh, on the whole putting together what I have heard, which is not a lot, um, the majority of those people have not felt anything other than uh, here, take a check, go get some counseling, get out of my office kind of thing. Like, this is not something we really want to deal with. The institutional response is kind of like, let's keep this as, as sort of short and quiet as possible, rather than um, open up and, and really listen to the person. That's that's truly shameful to hear when, when they should be offering as much help as they can. Um, and I mean, if it's, I, wish, I would say it's up to the survivor if they want to like um, make it public or not. But right. the, the, the church needs to do as much as they can to help the survivor instead of just writing them a check. It's it's just absolutely shameful of how of how they are treated like that. So. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get to like Catholic responses to survivors and the abuse crisis. Um, why do Catholics and other religious communities engage in cover up of, of abuse? I mean, it just seems so baffling. You know, what makes it uh, so difficult to do the right thing by, you know, just contacting the police? Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't. Sorry. Um, I don't want to let anyone off the hook here, um, but a bit of context is perhaps important. Um, Shen Gold's book, which I mentioned earlier, came out in 1991, um, and you can track in the clinical literature uh, a developing awareness of the massive uh, uh, 
difficulties created by childhood sex abuse. We don't begin to track that in the literature really until um, the late 1980s and in fact into the 1990s. Um, you know, the operative assumption um, for much of the last century was that, you know, stuff happens in childhood, just get over it, move on with it, no need to make a big deal about it. Um, and institutions have very powerful reasons for protecting themselves and watching out for each other. And so, even on those rare occasions when somebody may have gone to the police, um, it did not necessarily result in any sort of legal action. You know, the police chief may have gone over and had a quiet word with the bishop because, you know, the police chief was Irish Catholic, let's say, in Boston, for example. Um, and the bishop said, okay, thanks for letting me know. And, you know, I might have had a quiet word with Father So-and-so in his office. And that was probably about as far as it went. Um, so we didn't know how devastating it was. We didn't take it all that seriously. And we had very powerful reasons for... Uh, for not letting it get out um, because of the the risk of so-called scandal. Um, and so, again, none of that is to let anybody off the hook um, because all institutions engage in cover-up, uh, whether it's legal institutions, political, clinical, religious, uh, academic, and so on. Um, they don't want their, their professional reputations um, being tarnished. Um, once we started to realize, though, just how devastating childhood sexual abuse can be, um, I think people started to realize we can't just continue to ignore it. Um, that was sort of the first dawning awareness. I think for Catholics, the second piece of that was that um, aren't we supposed to be a body that is committed to the proclamation of the truth? Don't we spend our lives proclaiming the word of God? And doesn't the word of God say that the truth shall set you free? Uh, to be not afraid, right? To bring everything out into the open, um, to, to work towards the light and not to hide in the darkness, not to engage in works of deception. Aren't we committed to all this? Doesn't our scripture tell us all this? If so, then why are we hiding and covering up and, 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 and so on? So I think those two kind of dawning awarenesses um, have helped slowly and still very incompletely uh, prompt um, Catholics to sort of be more open about this. I, I certainly hope so. I mean, I can, we can only hope that maybe in the future um, that something will, will change, but only time will tell. But I'm not going to be surprised if we get like maybe another news story about like another like massive scandal it's like that's probably even bigger than say pennsylvania or god forbid france but only time will tell so next question um how should catholics respond to survivors who have left the church like what would be like the best way to interact with them like like it comes up in a conversation like the survivor says i left the church i don't like the church or maybe it, it, if the conversation like turns a bit nasty like you know the survivor who understandably you know doesn't um who understandably ha has a hatred for the church like you'll know, begin hurling insults or something like that how should a catholic respond in that situation um well it's again easier to answer how they should not respond um responding with any sort of defensiveness um is not only unhelpful and counterproductive but i think it's actually um just inappropriate in itself um you know we we claim to worship one who was uh as the scripture puts it like a lamb led meekly to the slaughter um who made no rebuke of his accusers uh who endured the worst forms of torture and humiliation and violent death it seems to me that we could learn from that uh, even just a little bit uh, in not jumping on people who have left the church and telling them they're wrong or they're going to hell or the church isn't that bad or they need to get over it or all that whole Fargo of self-justifying rubbish that people often come up with when they feel like they've got to defend the church. You don't need to defend anything. Um, 
the church has been around for 2,000 years, so it doesn't need your um, puffed up efforts. I think the only thing worth doing is listening, um, which is much harder than people realize. Uh, but to listen to people and let them tell their story um, and to not feel the urge either to defend the institution or to fix the problem. Most of us are very uncomfortable when people tell us stories of pain. We want to kind of give them some advice or tell them, here's what's going to make it feel better. Um, whether it's a, an abuse survivor or someone else going through a period of massive grief, what most of us want is simply to be heard um, and not be dismissed, not be defended against, not be told we're wrong, but just simply to be heard. Um, and again, that sounds very simple, but uh, from what I hear from from abuse survivors and their families, that's almost rarely, if ever, being done. Um, if you do that, <laughs> excuse me, that seems to me more than enough. Hmm. Now, moving on to the issue of abusers, um, some have claimed that the abuse crisis is mainly a problem of a febophile gay clergy. What would be your own response to this? Well, as I argued in the book, you know, there are two convenient scapegoats that people have used to avoid facing the complexity and the messiness of the problem. Um, two fantasies, really. Um, one is that it's all a problem of clericalism, and the other is that it's a so-called gay problem. The data don't let us um, buy into either of those conclusions. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a whole untold story. It was just starting to emerge when I finished my book on the abuse of, for example, female religious, right? Um, and the abuse of women in the church. Um, has it been overwhelmingly male on male abuse? Yeah, the data does seem to support that uh, in most contexts, including North America. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the whole story by any means. Um, and so what, right? That's kind of irrelevant. Abuse is abuse. Um, the person being abused is a human being. The person doing the abuse is a human being. Whether they're of the same sex, the opposite sex, old, young, it doesn't really matter. This is somebody doing something horribly wrong to somebody else. That's really the focus here. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, we've spun these fantasies that, well, we have to have more humble clergy who don't engage in clericalism. Great. Um, we have to keep out the gays from the seminaries, whatever that means. Um, these are preferred fantasies that people have because they, we, most of us tend to like to find simple solutions to what we imagine to be simple problems. Uh, and they're not simple problems. Um, and it's not just male on male. There's, as I say, a substantial portion of female. I've treated female victims um, in, the, in the church. Uh, and there's a lot more out there that uh, we haven't heard from yet. Um, so I don't know that those kinds of claims do much other than let people sort of brandish a kind of a simplistic idea of what you need to do to fix it, which of course is really not realistic. Now, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, you treat clergy, abuse, clergy abusers as well, correct? Um, <clears throat> I treat other uh, sexual abusers, adolescent and adult, I have not had any um, clergy yet. Do you, do you, have you had any colleagues um, who have uh, treated uh, clergy abusers? Uh, not people that I know well. Yeah, because I was going to ask, like, um, like, I was going to ask, like, what made you decide to treat such individuals? Like, I don't know, like, if you've, like, maybe read any, like, data, like, um, or, or um, literature on it. Like, um, do you, would, what would you say probably, like, at least motivates, like, to motivate, like, a clinician to uh, treat a sexual abuser, regardless of, like, whatever their profession is? Yeah, if you want a longer answer on that, I wrote an article in Commonweal um, <clears throat> about a year and a half ago talking about my experience treating uh, sexual abusers. Um, it's not a population I thought I was going to work with. Um, most of us probably, when hearing about it, kind of recoil from it, as I initially did years ago. Um, but I have very trusted um, colleagues who've worked in some of these programs for years um, and asked me to consider joining, and I did, and I'm very glad I did. Um, it's 
not easy work by any means. Clinical work rarely is. Um, but it's important to see them excuse me, as human beings. Um, and I think a lot of us can't do that. You know, we have convenient categories of people we like to scapegoat, and it seems to me sexual abusers are probably at the top of that list for most of us. But if you work with them clinically, you realize they are human beings like the rest of us. They made mistakes, but so do we. Um, they have struggles, but so do we. Um, none of this is to downplay the gravity of what they did. The, the, the men I work with, the boys and the men I work with are all on probation or parole. Um, they've either been to prison uh, or they're just out of prison or they're on the edge of being sent to prison. Um, so they're, they're not escaping what they did. There is, uh, you know, accountability here. Um, but they're also more than that, right? Just as you wouldn't say um, a person who is, who is uh, struggling with any other sin or temptation is, is the soul and sum of that sin or temptation. So too, we shouldn't do that here. Um, they deserve to be respected. And that, to my mind, is just basic theology and basic psychology, right? Basic clinical practice says you have to be open to every single person who walks through that door and treat them with the same, um, treat them in the same way with the same respect and empathy uh, that you would for anybody else. And that's Christianity 101 right there too, right? To love your neighbor, to love the stranger, to love the evildoer, um, to turn the other cheek to the one who strikes you. Um, so can it be uncomfortable initially for people? Yeah, um, but is it the kind of population we should all just sort of recoil from and lock up for the rest of our lives? No, um, because that's neither Christian nor human to do. It's definitely not a very popular opinion that, that, I, that I'm quite well, sure. I, I know. Yeah, I'm, I have. I know someone who's a uh, who's. I think she's worked with a um, um, sexually. No, actually, you know, she. I know that she's uh she's not a fan of these of the uh, sex offender registry in it, but I but I, but I believe she's uh she she's she's um advocates like mercy and redemption. I guess you could say. Um. So moving uh, moving on, I guess like probably the biggest question is. Why do these men commit their crimes? Like you know, either clerical abusers or any 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 uh, sexual abuser in general. You know, why do they do it? Is it for sexual gratification? Is it for a sense to feel powerful? Um, we're still learning and studying. This is a population again. Um, we only began to take the victims seriously about twenty five years ago in the clinical literature. Uh, it's even more recent, really, the last decade that we've started to study the abusers. So there's still a lot we don't know, uh, which makes answering questions like that a bit hazardous. Um, the answer that I could say would be that uh, what motivates abusers is almost as diverse as the population itself. You know, we, we perhaps have this image that Sexual abusers are kind of creepy old men in their middle ages, kind of losers on the edges of society, perhaps. But in fact, um, we see uh, abusers from all social strata, from all economic classes, from all religions, uh, from all educational backgrounds, ethnic, cultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds. Um, there's a tremendous diversity there. Um, what motivates their actions? Again, the data is not um, we don't have as much as, as we would like at this point, but it does seem possible to say that a small percentage of them um, are motivated sort of primarily uh, by sadistic motives. Um, a, a larger percentage of them are motivated by opportunity. There's a lot of sort of one-time offenders in the literature. You know, it's not like you've been You've been abusing little, little boys for 40 years or something, um, you know, with a thousand victims. Sometimes it's it's a one-time thing. Um, a, a lot of it is um, uh, loneliness, um, misguided search for affection, even basic physical touch. Um, so there's a there's a variety of motives, none of which justifies abusing anybody. But uh, as I say, it's hard to. Um, uh, to, to give a definitive answer because people people do it for different reasons. Uh, for some, it is you know a sexual thrill, but uh, that's not 
uh, the only reason for for all of them. Um, now you talked about like like the the diversity of like treatment for uh, for survivors. Would mm. like what would uh, like treatment of uh, an abuser consist of? Would it be just as diverse, or maybe is it more a bit uh, like straightforward or mm. like generalized? Yeah, in some ways it's it's very similar um, because uh, what we often see with abusers is that they have come themselves from um, often very difficult, sometimes even fairly horrendous childhoods, where they were you know subjected to abuse themselves, or parents were not around, or there were you know lots of problems with with drugs and violence and instability in the home, in and out of the foster system. Um, <clears throat> treatment of those who are attracted to, uh, for example, minors, um, is very difficult. We don't actually have a lot of well-established treatments. Um, and so what seems to be the emerging trend uh, today is um, trying to figure out new protocols for these treatments because a lot of the protocols that were used in the past are no longer uh, permissible today so for example you know 30 40 years ago um certain abusers of, of children were often put on what was called chemical castration given given uh um drugs to take that that sharply reduced the production of testosterone um uh, a lot of the past practices of treatment have have been discredited, and so we're we're figuring out what to do today. But in terms of in terms of standard psychotherapy for for someone who's referred to me, um, again, oftentimes it's working through um, a lot of their issues and then building up their own capacity to maintain um, critical insight. You know, that is to mentalize and uh, self control. So that they don't uh, reoffend. Now, um, let's see. Where was I? Now, moving on. Like for clinicians, um, for Catholic clinicians, clinicians, is it difficult recon reconciling what you are trained in with your faith? No. No. Uh, Eric Fromm, one of the great psychoanalysts and social critics of the last century, he was a friend of Pope John Paul II, for example. Um, Eric Fromm said that uh, both Freud and Jesus have the same goal, right? They're both two Jewish teachers who are committed to the destruction of idolatry and the pursuit of the of the truth by which we are set free. Um, and so, from in my mind, those two things have always been uh, crystal clear. We're here to seek the truth which sets us free, um, and there is no opposition. Uh, between theology and psychology on that point now you've t we've talked like this like i'm off, off the air before um as a clinician what do you find problematic when catholics tell survivors to quote unquote offer up their suffering that's horrible language which nobody should ever use um it's not your position to tell somebody else what to do with their pain um we resort to these gruesome cliches and these 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 wretched little phrases offer it up move on get over it um you know she's in a better place it's for the good you know all this kind of stuff um to deal with the sort of the 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 mystery of evil in some ways and the fact that we don't have um clear answers to a lot of our struggles no it would be far better for people to just keep silent if they can't say anything beyond these these, these horrible little slogans. Um, it's not up to you, uh, regardless of the person you're dealing with, to tell somebody else how to respond, uh, whether it's to you know the death of a, of a spouse or a child, uh, to being abused, to you know some kind of devastating loss. Um, that stuff does not help. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly patronizing um, to, to be on the receiving end of that. And so I, when people say, well, I don't know what to say, I say, well, then don't say anything, right? Uh, it's what what's uh, what a, a a chaplain I trained with thirty years ago used to call the ministry of presence. You know, my first clinical job was was doing pastoral counseling in a large nursing home with people who were dying, 
what do you do then, right? You want to go in there and utter some cliches uh, to them? You want to go in there and try and give them a program of self-improvement? No. You sit by the bedside and you hold their hand. If they want to talk, you listen. If they don't want to talk, you don't talk. Um, it's far better for people to just keep silent than to utter some of these these dreadful sayings. Um, now, when it comes to treating um, both survivors and abusers, what, does that put like a, any sort of strain on clinicians? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. It doesn't really for me as far as I know. Um, I can't answer that for anybody else. Um, I suppose it could. Um, but it, it, I find it actually mutually enriches. Uh, so that if I have, for example, an abuser who's downplaying what they did, well, it wasn't that bad. He didn't look that upset, you know, kind of kind of the rationalizations that some people do, especially early in treatment. I can draw on my work with the victims and say, well, you know, here's how it does affect them. Uh, here's how it did make them feel. Um, here's what they tell me. I mean, I don't break confidentiality, of course, but draw some general lessons from work with with survivors to help the abuser see a little bit um, just how devastating the work is, uh, how devastating their their actions were and damage is. Um, so that, yeah, I suppose it could be a, a, a difficult uh, two populations to serve at the same time. For me, the underlying basis, though, is the same, and that is that whatever you come in with, you're still a human being. Um, and that's where we begin. Um, I don't begin with a label on you all. This person's a depressive, this person's a schizophrenic, this person's a child abuser. You come in as, you know, Mary or Pierre or John, Sally, whatever. Um, and, and that's where we begin. Going back then to the issue of abusers, um, what, are abusers like usually court ordered into therapy or do some come in willingly recognizing that they have a problem? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, both. Um, and in fact, there's a third group uh, that I treat of people who feel like they've got an attraction that might lead them to do something criminal. So they want to come into therapy to try and get a handle on that before they act out. Um, but certainly the, um, the the bulk of the adolescents and adult males that I work with have been court ordered into treatment, which presents its own set of challenges. It's not an easy group to work with when you're forced to come, but uh, you can do good work with them as well. And I talk about that in the Commonweal article. I will qualify if I already asked this one. Like, um, um, what does like clergy uh, treatment of a clergy abuse abuser? Um, sorry, I actually shouldn't say clergy. What does like um, treatment of a of an abuser consist of? Well, uh, it takes us back to the earlier discussion. I think of the threefold process that Judith Herman outlined. Right, to be in a safe place, to tell the story to rework the story in order to move on with your life. Those are the, sort of the broad parameters. Uh, beyond that, I really can't say, because every individual treatment is based upon the individual, and no treatment is alike. Um, people sometimes think, well, you know, it's kind of a cookie-cutter or assembly line approach. You got this problem, come in, we do this, and away you go. No, uh, clinical work is highly individualized. Uh, and so <clears throat> I can't really say, you know, what it looks like in, in the abstract. Um, now, as for in your as a clinician, do you personally have any hope that the that the clerical abuse crisis might be resolved one day? Or do you not see like do you not necessarily necessarily see a light at the end of that tunnel? Um, <clears throat> uh, more than a decade ago, I was doing some research for an article on early canon law uh, on and what I discovered you go back you comb through the collections of canons I think I went back as far as the fourth century um, so every century in every document I could lay my hands on there are canons talking about the problems of clerical sex abuse um, talking about it in some cases in, in very different language from what we would use today um, but what that told me was that this is a problem that's been around from the beginning. Um, and so it's not a problem that, you know, short of the coming of the fullness of the kingdom of God, uh, is ever going to completely go away. So nobody should be naive about this, right? Uh, as long as we are human beings in our fallen, sinful state, um, with various disordered desires, 
there's always going to be the risk that we do horrible things to ourselves and to each other. That's never going to stop until, you know, the, the final kingdom. Um, so constant vigilance has to be our practice. That said, um, I think the Catholic Church in the last five to ten years, uh, in some parts of the world, not all, um, has started to wake up, started to take this seriously, started to try to make some changes to make it harder for abuse to be swept under the carpet, easier to be reported, easier to get these guys out of the clergy. Um, so there has been progress. Um, will we ever make it go away? No, that's kind of magical thinking. Uh, it's like saying, well, we're going to make disease go away, right, or death go away. Yeah, well, when the final kingdom comes, um, you know, if Revelation 21 is to be believed, disease and death and, and evil like sex abuse will go away. But until we achieve that, uh, we always have to be on our guard. Now, like, would you say, in your personal opinion, would you say Catholic clinicians maybe are a bit more critical of the church hierarchy with the way they've handled things regarding the abuse crisis? Well, I don't really interact with a lot of Catholic clinicians. Um, uh, and when we do, we tend to talk about other things than this. Um, so I don't know. Um, I suppose that's a that's a possibility um, uh, because we see the damage uh, in a way that most leaders in the church probably don't. Uh, but I, I can't really say beyond that. Hmm. Now let's see where were we now? Like now, now regarding like I'm um, solving the crisis. Like what reforms in your in your view need to, uh, does the church need to undergo to help essentially like you know mitigate i don't know maybe not necessarily put an end put an end to it but at least um get it to the point like where like it's all it's like almost like non-existent well for that you should read my book um because i got very concrete in there and i laid out proposals at the level of the parish the level of the diocese uh the level of the regions uh the level of the countries and the level of the universal church um now what can we as the laity or the legs, as you write in your book, um, do to help put an end to help, like you know, like, um, s solve the crisis. Like some people might say, like you know, just like you know, do the right thing by, by you know by reporting the abuse. But is mm -hmm. there anything more we can do about that? Yeah, I think um, constant vigilance is something for everybody. And so, let's say you report the abuse and nothing happens. Um, you know, you'd be like the like the widow in the gospel uh, who just simply doesn't give up until she gets justice. You report the abuse and months go by and nothing happens. You keep pounding on that door, you know, the chancery door or whatever it is, uh, to find out what's going on, right? What have you done? Um, why haven't you done something? Uh, make sure that nobody has the chance to um, brush you off uh, and, and fail to act. Um, I think that's, that's something very concrete that people can do. Um, and, you know, just... Keep an eye out for things. Uh, if you think that something is looking a little dodgy, um, you figure out what's going on and and what you need to do about that. You know, if if um, there's something that makes you uncomfortable, don't just ignore that. Pay attention and uh, uh, and investigate and and see. Um, it's you know, Indiana and I think most of the other states in this country have taken the approach that everyone who is a legal adult is what's called a mandated reporter, which means that if I know of a story um, of a child being sexually abused right now, I am obligated under the law to report it to the Department of Child Services. Um, and But that's not because I'm a clinician, that's because I'm an adult. Um, <clears throat> and that should really be the approach in the church, right? Well, we shouldn't just leave this up to the abuse you know, um, coordinator's office in the chancery or leave it up to the vicar for clergy or whatever it is. Um, if we took that approach that we're all mandated reporters uh, in the church and in the secular state, um, we might have, you know, some better luck in, in cleaning this up. Um, expanding further upon that, um, let's see, where was I? Uh, oh, yeah, now I, now I remember, like, do you personally know of like any um, cases of, of Catholics, like particularly clergy, um, who did the right thing by contacting the police when someone you know reported um, abuse? Yes, I've seen that um, several times um, uh, in the last 
five years or so. Um, it does seem to be increasingly uh, accepted in parts of the church that we go to the police. Uh, if this is if this is something that needs criminal investigation, we go. Uh, we don't wait to have our hand dragged or for this to kind of emerge five years down the road. We take it um, to the police right now. So in some places, people are, I think, finally um, doing the right thing in that regard. Are there any like dioceses um, that would you say are like um, like good models for like um, for handling abuse? Uh, not having studied most of them, I really can't say. Now, um, let's see. Wrapping up here, um, what would you say? Actually, no. Hold on. Where where was I? Do do do. Yeah, I guess we'll just wrap it. Um, so can you tell me, like, um, right now, like, are you working on anything new? Are you working on any uh, books or articles uh, about this? Um, not about this topic in particular. I'm working on a book right now about, um, with the tentative title on being a psychiatric monk, um, which part of it will explore the connection between early Christian monastic practice in Evagrius at Pontus on the one hand and uh, Freudian psychoanalysis on the other. Um, no, I wrote that article in Commonweal on my work with sex abusers. I wrote that entire book in 2019. Um, I think I've said, you know, and there's a slew of articles I wrote for Catholic World Report, the National Catholic Reporter, or the National Catholic Register, um, America, Commonweal, uh, Catholic Herald in England, uh, diocesan papers, um, OSV, our Sunday visitor. You know, so I, I, I think I've more than said my piece over the last decade on this problem. I don't anticipate writing much else about it, but who knows? Could change down the road. Uh, going back, like I actually wanted to go back, like to the issue of like, clergy abusers. Like, um, who would you say, like, um, like are probably some of, like the. Uh, worst offenders in terms of like um, covering up abuse like um whether it's like any individual like layman or cler clergyman etc well i don't know that we have an olympics of offenders um <clears throat> and so i can't really say that a lot of the stories have been particularly horrendous the the one that stands out in my mind i suppose probably because it was the first uh goes back to 1989 um at Mount Cashel Orphanage in St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, I grew up in Canada, um, and that was the first big story that broke. You know, people in this country talk about Boston in 2002 or McCarrick in 2018, uh, but the 1989 story in Canada, um, decades before, uh, really put this on the radar for me. Um, and that was a long-term a uh, multi-generational, multi-decade uh, cover-up of, in some cases, really sadistic abuse. You know, there's people that abuse for sexual reasons, and then there's people that abuse to cause pain because they enjoy pain. Uh, and to read the report on the Mount Cashel Orphanage, which was run by a Roman Catholic uh, religious order, um, it is, again, probably because it was the first one I came across when I was in my late teens, um, you know, forever seared in my memory, but that doesn't mean that it's the worst. Um, I don't know that, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, like, what consequences do you personally foresee, like, um, occurring if, like, the church, like, you know, continues to go down, like, you know, the path that it's currently doing, like, you know, not, like, you know, doing its doing its utmost, like, you know, to, to help uh, survivors and also put bring uh, abusers to justice? Um, you know, prognostications about the future are kind of a hazardous business. Um, people have written off the Catholic Church in decades and centuries past, and then it comes roaring back. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know. Um, I think there's going to continue to be a slow decline in some places, partly connected to this, but partly for many other reasons. Um, but we also know that the church is growing in other parts of the world. So um, uh, it's, yeah, I wouldn't hazard a guess as to what the future would hold. 
Oh, there's another question I wanted to ask about abusers. Like, um, I remember, I know you said like um, they, some of them come from like broken homes. Um, do abusers like have like some devotion to some sort of faith, whether it's Christianity or something else? Yeah, as I said, they come from every background. So you can be Mennonite, Mormon, Buddhist, Muslim, you know, Irish Catholic, um, German. Um, you can have gone to mass every day of your life. You've gone to mass once a year. Um, there's no, there's no uh, single pattern here. Um, uh, people can come from incredibly prosperous, healthy homes um, and abuse, but they can also come from incredibly destructive, basically non-existent homes and not abuse. Um, so background does not dictate uh, future conduct. Um are there any signs that someone should be aware of, like, you know, that someone could potentially be um, an abuser or is trying to groom a potential victim? Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me, grooming is an interesting topic. We're just um, starting to see some interesting publications on the last couple of years. Um, in fact, I wrote an article about that for Catholic World Reports probably two years ago now, sort of looking at... Um, can't remember how many were on the list, maybe seven or eight um, criteria of grooming behavior to watch out for. Um, so that is that is something that people, you know, should keep an eye out for um, and and uh, just, just um, you know, trust your gut. If something feels um, like this is a little bit off or this doesn't quite make sense or I'm not quite sure why they're doing this, then investigate and find out. Um, um, people have also said, like, you know, that a major part of this issue is uh, clericalism. How would you personally define that issue? Yeah, as I said earlier, that's one of the two convenient scapegoats, uh, and I'm not convinced that that's the problem. That's part of the problem, but it's not the only the only part of the story. Um, and I think that's something else that we've kind of got on the radar now in the church that people are starting to be aware of. Uh, and maybe make some changes um, towards. Uh, but is it, you know, a major factor? No, I think it's more complicated than that. Um, going on, a question about your book. On page 41, you say the church needs to undergo a, quote, necessary iconoclasm, unquote, to, with regard to paternalistic titles, images, and practice, practices. Mm -hmm. So what would you say are some examples of this? Um, well, look at how we have basically stolen from the secular world various exalted titles, forms of dress, um, residences, forms of, of deference to uh, clergy, particularly bishops. Um, you know, your excellency, your eminence, your holiness. Um, you live in a, you know, an Episcopal palace or the apostolic palace in Rome. We genuflect before you. We kiss your hand. We kiss your ring. None of this is Christianity, right? This is this is all secular court ritual that we've borrowed from the royal courts of Europe, um, and before that of, of so-called Byzantium. Um, we exalt these men uh, and 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 portray them in these absurd fashion. They're just men. They're just some guys. Um, and I think we really need to take that seriously. Um, they're just human beings like we are. Well, they've been ordained, they've got the sacred chrism put on them, they've got this ontological mark and all this other stuff. They're human beings, right? Ordination does not in itself convey any sort of greater increase in intelligence, never mind holiness. Um, and so iconoclasm here is sort of smashing these images of these, these um, uh, these men as as some kind of uh, exalted human beings over us. No, they're not. Um, they're on the same level as us. We're all brothers and sisters of the same father. Uh, and, and this idea, this urge we have to put people on pedestals and to kiss their rings and give them titles and let them let them go around in you know watermark silk um, uh, and, and and live in palaces. <laughs> is a profoundly infantilizing thing to do. I don't know why any human being who who, who would want to do that. Um, it degrades you as much as them, and it doesn't help them. 
right? It doesn't help people to be treated that way. In fact, it makes it easier for people to feel like they can get away with stuff because they, they've, they've got this reputation, they, they have this image. So people say, well, Father so-and-so could never have done that. He's practically a saint, you know? Uh, the Pope, the Pope, he, he would never, he would never allow these things, you know? He's the Pope, he's the, he's the, the most holy father. Um, come on, let's be real. Yes, that's that's one of the issues that I I personally seen, with, especially with regard to a more recent case, which I won't mention won't mention here. But uh, your book mentions the uh, problem of idolatry and particularly papalatry. If I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, mm -hmm. um, what what makes that uh, papalatry uh, problematic, and how does it tie into the abuse crisis? Well, it's of a species of what I was just talking about, right? The Pope is this exalted figure, even beyond priests and nuns and bishops and cardinals um he's he's often been basically seen as sort of you know the vice regent or the viceroy of god on earth um this kind of demiurge this sort of you know half divine figure himself um somewhere suspended between heaven and earth again he's a man right he's a human being that's it um does he have a job to do yes but is he a human being at the beginning the middle and the end of the day yes um this urge to you know plaster your home with a picture of the pope mention him constantly you know catholics who define themselves as well you know we're followers of the pope um this is this is and this is a recent thing i mean if you read owen chadwick for example one of the great oxford historians of our time um or you read john pollard um or eamon duffy these are all really excellent contemporary historians who've looked at the shift in the papacy from uh, roughly 1870 onward. Um, prior to 1870, most Catholics in the world couldn't even tell you what the, the name of the Pope was. They had no idea who this guy was, and they didn't care. Uh, and the church was probably a lot healthier for that. Today, we've got the Pope all over the place. He makes the headlines, you know, on a daily basis sometimes. Um, he's constantly invoked in the church. People have pictures of him in their homes. Every chancery office you go into has got a picture of the Pope up. Catholic schools have got pictures of the Pope up. Who cares, right? He's a man doing a job. Uh, he's not the viceroy of God on earth, some kind of oracle, um, even though we've made him into that, you know, sort of, well, the Pope says something, I mean, just watch the headlines, right? The Pope makes an offhand comment about anything, uh, it rockets up to the headlines. Why? Right? He's a, he's a bishop. Uh, he's the bishop of Rome, um, but he's also a human being. Do we deserve to hang on his every word? No, we don't. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean, we could see that all the time with um, with Pope Francis. Now, I, I know you only have an hour here, so do you um, do you have any recommendations for other sources um, for Catholics to look at if they want to explore uh, this topic any further? Um, no. I mean, again, my twenty nineteen book and the bibliography in there, I think, has probably got the the most compact list of sources. Um, it didn't cover a lot of the clinical literature, but people could always contact me if they wanted to discuss that in more detail or ask me about certain certain sources. Um, I think that's it. Awesome. Well, I thank you so much for your time. I apologize if I was a bit sure. disorganized. That's this, right. is my, this is my first time doing this on my own, but I do truly appreciate it. And I hope that the audience is going to appreciate your insight as well. And Hopefully, maybe we can see some progress in the future with regard to the abuse crisis. But again, only time will tell. Indeed. All right. All right. Well, God bless you, Dr. DeVille. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.